I'm Ray uh, Murakawa from uh, California. And a, a few years ago, I, I created a, a tool called Melodrip, this small thing. It's, it's an instrument that helps you brew uh, with clarity and, and, and higher sweetness. And it's, it's essentially a water diffusion screen that uh, allows you to control agitation. So we have a bunch of information on what this does and why I use it and why people use it um, on the site. But otherwise, I've been mainly focusing on this tool and brewing techniques for the past five years, I think. We launched this a few years ago, and since then, we've had competitors win with this and a bunch of home brewers find different techniques and ways to use this. So uh, our community is about learning about brewing techniques and finding different ways to brew and alternative ways to brew, especially at home, because uh, home brewing is, is kind of unique in a way that we have luxury of time and luxury of resources that we can, we can spend on this hobby. So we get really deep in our community. And I think a lot of the conversations I have about brewing aren't just about mellow drip. I think most of them are just about basic brewing techniques. So uh, I just put together a little kind of video demonstration type of thing just on uh, on something very fundamental about brewing that I just want to share with you guys. And I know some of you guys are like really advanced, some of you maybe not. Um, uh, so it's not about mellow drip. It's basically just about uh, pouring. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and start this video and you guys could chime in anytime you want. And hopefully I'll be able to talk over it and uh, kind of give you insight. Um, but it's a little kind of Q&A in the beginning. So uh, feel, to, feel free to, to let me know if you have any questions or comments during the whole thing. All right. So let me share a screen here. Do you think we can brew together, like with Mellow Drip and without Mellow Drip? <laughs> <laughs> I know that? I have one, but... <laughs> Oh, no, no, this is this is this is mostly like, you know, I put a video together just kind of explaining a certain a certain technique. Yeah, it has really doesn't have anything to do with Melodrip. So uh, if anything, it's just kind of information that I'm kind of playing with right now. Um, so right now I can't share a screen because I think you might be sharing a screen or. Uh, yeah, I was playing the background music, I guess. Uh, give me a second. All right. Can you share a screen now? Yeah. Do you guys see what's going on? Yeah. Can you see? Cool. Okay. So I'm just going to play this and kind of commentary along with it. Um, so this is just like a really basic demonstration of a pour. So the question here is, can you guys tell what's wrong with this pour? And it's not the color or how funky anything looks. It's, it's essentially the pour. You guys notice anything interesting or something that you change or something that's wrong? I think I have been using this method for a while. I saw this first from James Hoffman. <laughs> okay. All right. Guys, what do you think? Like, what could be the uh, problem here? Is it called kubumi or something like that? Yeah, but it has nothing to do with that preparation. It's just focus on the pour of the kettle. And the thing is that if you showed me this, even like a, a, a few months a few months ago, I would not be able to answer either. It looks okay. Like the kettle isn't bobbing up and down. The pour seems pretty circular and concentric. I'm not missing any spots dramatically. So here's a side view of the same pour because it's done by me, um, but it's a cross section of it. So this is actually in real time. 
Wow. Yeah, I think it's it's clear that all of the particles is like、uh, running around, right? Yeah. So so there is a lot of turbulence that you can see there, but there's one fundamental thing that we can't see from the top when we're actually pouring. That's true. And this is one thing. If if I turn if I turn this dripper. You'll see what it is. This area right here. So this is a huge dry patch. That、um, this is something that we can't see from the top. It looks like I poured great.、Um, there's no real issues. I think if you go to textbook how to pour using a using that kettle. I pretty much hit most of the boxes. You could probably nitpick here and there, but it looked good. But from the inside, it doesn't, and this is mainly because、uh, we have particles on glass. So this isn't supposed to be a one-to-one -one representation of how particles behave in、uh, a dripper with a filter. But this is kind of an extreme case that you can actually experience and feel、um, with a stick if you go in there with like a thin.、Uh, I use a glass stick. You can use a chopstick to feel around. These are the kinds of things that. I typically try to identify when I'm blooming, and what the phenomenon here is is just a clump of hydrophobic particles. So there's a lot of fines in this patch that are deflecting water, and the part of the point of this demonstration is to kind of show how important the pore angle is and to be conscious of what the pore angle is. So right here, I. I kind of do a split here. If I put this kettle closer to the edge of the dripper, the kettle pour, you can see that the angle is—it's fairly similar.、Mm -hmm. It's not perpendicular. It's not, not really perpendicular to the to the to the bed or the slurry, but it's kind of at a similar angle to the inner side or the side that's closer to you. So as I keep pouring,、oh. it's really easy to. Kind of overlook or over pour over this area that has a dry pore. So even from the top,、uh, it looks concentric. It looks perfect. Everything's great. This is what、oh. all just tell you to do. And I continue to miss that one area. So from the top, you can see this. I'm not bobbing. The circles look fine. So this is in our head. This green funnel is going on. This is what we're thinking when、yeah. we're pouring. We're thinking that we're pouring in a concentric、yeah. uh, with this verticality to it and this symmetry. So from above, it's it's kind of deceptive, but in actuality, it's kind of angled. This tilt. So we have to、uh, think about our pouring. If we're pouring in this way, this is a specific case because this is me pouring with my flow rate with a certain amount of water I have in the kettle. Using this fellow EKG, you'll have probably different pore angles based on the pore rate and the flow rate of your kettle. But this is this particular demonstration. This is not supposed to be a universal rule. I'm I'm giving you an observation of what's happening in my room.、Um, so I tilted this、um, this conceptual spiral in the mil middle to kind of match what's actually going on. This is similar to the angle of the pore that I'm executing at the moment, and you could see that. From the top, it looks great, but from the side, it's tilted. So my concentric circle, a lot of the tip of the kettle here, is actually focusing more on the outer wall away from you, rather than、uh, the, the the wall that's、uh, closer to you. And this is kind of like a bias that I think happens depending on how you pour.、Um, no matter how much you focus on. I'm pouring correctly, or I'm I'm pouring straight, or whatever it is. You have to be kind of conscious of what the angle is doing, because the entry point you could draw a circle, but the actual infiltration angle of the the water could be like this, and that's the reason why I'm I'm missing that dry patch. So that's kind of like the first.、Um, I, I think it's like a first fundamental thing that people should think about. If it's like you're going into like a more advanced or intermediate 
uh, pouring techniques. Like people tell you to pour in a circle. Some people tell you to pour in the center and that's fine. Regardless of uh, if you do a circular pour, if you do a straight pour or whatever it is, oftentimes there's some kind of angle and that angle, if you're conscious of that angle, you could bring that kettle closer uh, to yourself to maybe pick up any of those areas that might not be in focus because the tip of the kettle is only like a singular tip for so long. Once it hits the side of uh, uh, the dripper wall or when it's becoming in contact with certain areas of the brew bed that may be deflecting uh, water, you just immediately get turbulence um, that just spreads all over the place. And it's kind of random, but it, it also diffuses a lot of the, the pressure and the energy of that single tip. So like in our brain, we're thinking that we have this single tip that we're scraping the wall and all this stuff. Uh, in actuality, there's a lot that we can't control and a lot that we can't really see. So which, which kind of leads into the second segment, but if anyone has any questions, let me know. <laughs> Cause I know, I, I feel like I'm just kind of rambling, but that's what, you know, that's why I had this visual aid to kind of uh, just put this out there and see if people have noticed this or people um, have any ideas or any comments about uh, what question. So for example, if after the, after you <clears throat> pour the first pour, you shake the slurry a little bit. Yes, yes, th yes. Does that work? That's coming up. That's coming up later in the video. <laughs> uh, so yeah, good question. You know, I included that in the video because I know that there's going to be a question about that. But uh, yeah, I'll get to you. I'll get to you, Adrian. All right. So if there's no other questions, I, I can move on. I can get, get on to the second part. We can have a kettle with two necks. Ah, see, there it is, right? So that's another thing. And that's a great comment because I've seen that before. Um, and also there's a guy, uh, Lance Hedrick at Onyx, um, who I think was second place Brewers Cup this year. He pours, I, I don't know exactly know his recipe, but he told me that he started pouring some of his pour uh, and you know, he'll split his pours up. And then the second time he'll pour, he'll, he'll turn the dripper around because he knows that there's a bias uh, in terms of like where the kettle is hitting the, the inside of the slurry. So maybe you'll split up your bloom or your pours. If you do a multi pulse pour, if you do like four pours, the first pulse will be at like 12 o'clock. Then the next pulse, you'll twist it to like three o'clock and then to six o'clock and then nine o'clock or whatever it is. And that could be one type of manual intervention that you do to kind of ensure that you're hitting uh, all points of the slurry because it's not that this is happening all the time. And this isn't a, a direct representation of what it looks like with a filter. But we know that due to certain uh, uh, poor angles that, that, that are entering into the slurry, you can be focusing more energy and, and water in one area than the other, especially like in terms of like uh, the side that's closer to you and the side that's farthest from you. It could be getting very different types of turbulence and energy from the kettle. I come to one more idea, sorry. It's, it's a little bit off topic, but if you design uh, some tool like Mellow Drip that is in shape of, uh, for example, this uh, dripper, like V60, and you put in between uh, dripper and the filter, and then you pour inside that tool, so the water comes evenly from all the sides from to the coffee, and then you will hit coffee grounds with the same temperature and the same amount of water in the same time. And then all will be wet. I don't know, does this make sense? No, it makes total sense. And, th and that's, that's a great thing about this community because we're always thinking about like, how do, how do we do this? How do we do that? Like, how do we get all the heat and hydration at once? You know, how do we maximize, optimize all the energy that we're using so we, we yield the best cup of coffee? Um, and that stuff is totally doable. It's just the only problem is like when once you get to the point of like, okay, let's make this thing. Um, is it easy to use? Is it easy to clean? Uh, is it gonna you know cost X amount of money to produce and actually distribute? And like, does it appeal to more people than just us? You know, like kind of the hardcore 
brewing community. So there's all kinds of ways that you could do this. And I think like, this is the reason why a lot of people prefer like immersion methods, because you could just dump hot water into a vessel and not guarantee, but you know, ensure that you're just hitting everything at the same time. Not having to worry about any of these inconsistencies based on some kind of random variable like turbulence. So, you know, there's there's preferences to certain brew, brewing methods because of ideology and theories that we think are more optimal or more, uh, I guess, theoretically efficient, um, and that's fine. But at this at the end of the day, everyone loves V60s and conical drippers because they taste great and they're consistent. So, this kind of defect or this kind of uh, I guess miss that I have in my pouring doesn't affect the brewing to an extent where I'm like, ah, this tastes nasty, you know, and it might go unnoticed. It might not be so dramatic, but the reason why I do this is because we can't see most of what's going on in a pour over. Uh, it's really difficult to uh, get feedback from your action that you're actually inputting into the dripper. So uh, the more knowledge that we have about what could be happening or what possibly is happening, we can always map that back to if we have something in the taste that we don't like, we can kind of point to several things that we can fix or uh, we can focus on to make better, to improve. Um, so yeah, definitely hitting everything at the same time, having a device that would kind of spread everything at the same time from the inside, from the outside in maybe. Um, and then you could yeah. probably push that device to you know ensure that there's no clumping on, on, on the edges, right? Like there's all these cool things that we could do. And, and the thing is, I think people probably make stuff like that and they just might not post them to IG or whatever. You know, there could be weird stuff out like that. You know, like I'm thinking about like those weird head scrapers that have all these arms and you could just stick it in and just agitate the whole, you know, all the walls at once or something, you know? There's, there's a million things that you could do to like fix this problem, but is this problem so major that we need to fix it? Probably not, you know, that's the thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not shooting your idea down. I'm just saying that like a lot, of, a lot of stuff is happening, you know, when we're brewing that could be technically wrong. It's that like 5% we're like, oh man, this is gonna kill me, but it doesn't, you know, because coffee is so complex, like the flavor is so complex this imbalance might not be perceivable or it might be might not be perceivable to an extent that changes that positive to a negative flavor. Um, so that's the thing, you know, the value prop of the product or the value prop of the idea or the technique that we have. It has to continue to be uh, usable or valuable to people, you know, all kinds of people, you know, regardless of the kind of gear that they use or whatever. Um, so I'm just going to go on to the next, this next session. This, this next session is about how well fine particles deflect water. And, and like I, I keep saying this, that I don't believe that this is a 100% representation of what happens when there's a filter, because filter papers get soaked from uh, the sides and from the inside as well, because water is spreading as it's saturating the filter. But um, in this instance, this is like an extreme case, which does occur in a filter um, that you could just feel after you bloom, is that this dry patch, because uh, it's at this similar angle as the, the pore, it's almost parallel to the pore, um, the tip of the kettle doesn't provide enough energy to actually break it apart. Now, if it was on the opposite side of the wall, it could probably disperse this patch but because it's on this weaker inner side, it's, it's really difficult to actually target it. And I think a lot of the reason why stuff like this happens is at the bottom of the statement is, is, is awareness. And, and being aware of stuff and thinking that you're aware of stuff, like we could stick 16 thermometers in here and we can have two scales measuring the input output flow rate. And we could have all of our numbers down, but stuff like this happens. We can't account for that, right? So we have this we have this idea that we can inject all of this information and knowledge uh, into into coffee and try to explain things, but stuff like this can happen. And this is probably one of a million things that are probably happening that we can't see moment to moment because we can't look into the dripper, especially with the filter on. So awareness is a big thing. Um, 
it's kind of deceiving to think that we have uh, awareness all the time because we're pouring from the top. Like I have all this control, man. Like I'm using this and I'm using that and I got the best gear and all this stuff. And my technique is crazy. Look at, look at my, you know, my flat bed and my, my spirals are looking amazing. But at, this, at the end of the day, you know, coffee is going to do what it does because it's a trillion particles um, being handled with turbulence, which is kind of a random variable that most people don't know how to understand. So that's one thing that we kind of have to look out for as well, especially when I thank you guys for the attention and time. Can I have one question more? Recently, I found a method of uh, mixing firstly water and coffee to bloom, and then this slurry uh, put into the V60, and then continue with uh, pouring other water. So would you, you, you have the grounds like in a vessel and then you just pour water in there just to kind of degas on its own and then pour it back in? Yes, and then this bloom and slurry coffee uh, take to the V60 to continue brewing. That's fantastic, man. <laughs> That's great, man. I, I'm going to try that right when we get off the call. That's it's not my idea. Journey, yeah. uh, he, he put that on his Instagram and he uh, say, say the name of the person who invented that. And so this way you uh, like bloom coffee in some vessel that you want and wait this 30 or 45 seconds. And then this uh, coffee and butter uh, put uh, or move to the V60 or your brewing uh, dripper and then continue as usual. No, that's great. There is a competitor from Intelligentsia, like I think like four or five years ago, that won Brewers Cup in the US that did a, a, a similar kind of method where she, um, I think it was kind of like a, a, an immersion and then post kind of filtered through the dripper after the whole water was added. So it wasn't like exactly like what you're saying where you're kind of handling the bloom specifically in a certain vessel and then throwing it back in the V60 and then resuming the rest of your yes, yes. Yeah, that's cool. It's kind of, but, it's a different thing, but it-, it Yeah, I'm recently sure. I've, I discovered this clever dripper that I like yeah. the idea and somehow it's like combining these two <laughs> methods. Yeah. yeah, like a hybrid immersion dripper, right? Yes, yes. Thanks for, thanks for sharing, Ray. That's a lot of information. I, uh... <laughs> yeah, really impressed like uh, how much you can talk about this it's just uh, is another level of knowledge uh do you think your this kind of thing um well your understanding for coffee for baristas work in the shop can they like think about all these things when they borrow coffee for customers when they're no, very busy i don't think so and and that's the thing is is i don't target my uh my products or my knowledge to cafes because every cafe has their own bottom line. They're brewing against, kind of brewing against the PL. Like they know that they have to serve X amount of cups per hour um, and keep customers happy. And that's the most important thing for a cafe. Uh, and that's, that's kind of different from, I think, home brewers and what we do is that we have a certain amount of time and resource allocated to what we like, which is brewing. And then we try to, Kind of optimize uh, the process more than anything. So I think most of the time when I'm doing a lot of stuff, like I'll have conversation with competitors and baristas and, and home brewers, but typically like it's not aimed for people who need to squeeze a drink out in two and a half minutes. Like it just, it doesn't make sense. Um, the theories just don't align, the, the value props don't align. And um, there are some cafes that use Melodrip for certain kind of like slow bar orders if they have like an exotic coffee or if they have some type of like meet and greet education area or time allotted for that, like maybe a class or something. And it'll work in that specific environment to enjoy a different perspective on brewing and brewing experience and coffee. But at the end of the day, no, it's not designed and meant for a cafe that needs to pump a drink out like really quick. It just doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't work that way. It does in certain parts of the, of the world. Like I know in Asia, people expect to have coffee served to them um, in, in a matter that's based on the master's 
uh, preference and, and way of brewing. So they're paying for that experience. Coffee is a little more expensive in these traditional kisatens or cafes, and that's understandable. Um, but in the West, it's all about kind of fuel me up. I need that caffeine. Let's go. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, and that's kind of dictates how coffees are roasted and the solubility and how easy and quick they are to brew. Um, so it kind of goes down the whole chain of how coffee is prepared and produced. And like something like hardcore home brewing isn't really part of that. Uh, it can be, there's, there's always overlap. Like we get a lot of information from cafes and I think people who work in cafes uh, have to understand what consumers want. They don't have to do what consumers do or, or know, what con you know, know what the latest technique is, but they have to be in tune what consumers expect. Um, so there's always a communication, um, but no, it's, 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 it's always based on how are you gonna pay? you know, uh, that rent, you know, when, when you own a cafe. So there's no expectation on using advanced techniques or like techniques that take a lot of time in a cafe, just, you know, unless that's part of your presentation or it's part of the, you know, it's part of the vibe of your cafe. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, just wondering if anybody used your mellow drip during competition, it's kind of a cheating. <laughs> no, it's not, it's hard to handle, man. It's like, <laughs> You know, people brewing like multiple cups of coffee within like you know x amount of time you're holding all this stuff uh there were you know in in the finals there are about i think there's four competitors using md and then two of them uh alika lifty who won first place uh you know we made him a custom mellow drip that sits on top of uh the dripper and it, it'll just basically just kind of sit there so he doesn't have to worry about it and then he does his thing but he has a recipe that's designed for that kind of brewing approach. Um, other people will basically just have it in their hand and they'll just be pouring like this. And it's, it's, it's hard to keep track of uh, because of, I think basically because you're doing so many things at once when you're presenting as a competitor that you don't want more things on your plate to man, uh, manage and handle. Um, so it, it's definitely not cheating, you know, on, on the <laughs> If you win with Milladrip, you're kind of like more of a badass because you're maintaining that much more crap on, you know, <laughs> on your presentation table. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. It multiplies the drama that you have to go to. I mean, it's, it might look more cool or whatever, but the, the brisk that the competitor is taking a risk because it's, it's difficult um, to kind of manage that. So like when competitors, you know, think about using Milladrip, they do ask me, uh, a lot of questions on just optimizing the recipe, making it easier to do, quicker to do. Um, how can I use this without holding it? So there's been a lot of mods and customizations uh, for Melodrip um, in, in use in competition. So no, this, you're like a super person if you could, if you could kick ass on stage with this thing. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, we, we talk a lot about your understanding for pour over coffee and it's just really another level and you invent into mellow drip just to make pour over easier? Well, for competitors, probably not. Uh, <laughs> do you think you can show us how you brew like uh, pour over with mellow drip? And then uh, I guess not everyone here has a mellow drip, so we can see how, or can, you can tell us the taste different, right? <laughs> and yeah, then maybe yeah. we can use V60 or some other like a draper to pour a coffee together. I think that'll be the fun part. You guys, okay. I mean, I gotta, I gotta warm up some water. Are you guys? Do you guys want to brew something right now? Yeah, or... yeah. <laughs> it's mid midnight, right, Tenji? <laughs> but I think we always do that coffee, midnight coffee. I've never used this before. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, guys, yeah. Uh, whoever wants to uh, brew coffee together, if you don't have a mellow drip, I think it's the time we can pour some, uh, boil some water and brew together with your own recipe. All right. All right, let me let me just start warming the water up, man. Yeah. Okay, guys, let's have uh, five minutes break and uh, get ready the water, and then we brew together. And you can talk about your own coffee. And uh, I know and Andres in the coffee shop working today in the coffee truck, so we can talk about that. And we have Praise here from Brazil, and we can talk about Brazilian coffee and how we brew that. What is a special recipe? Awesome.
All right, we're gonna play some music, so let's make some coffee together. Santi, what time is there? You're still reporting coffee with us. Almost 11. <laughs> 11 p.m., right? Yes. <laughs> I guess still brew coffee at 1 a.m. Okay. <laughs> You're the crazy one. <laughs> Could you show us your brine size? Yes, yes. Great. Oh. I think that's ultimate question. How much is coarse and how much is fine and medium? <laughs> I know, right? What is We have to get a, uh, some kind of like uh, some type of approved or regulation uh, printout or something, right? That has all of these <clears throat> just kind of particle designs on them, and then we could all print it out and say, "Oh, okay, I'm closer to this 
kind of distribution. Um, because yeah, it's that is it's a really crazy uh, it's a really crazy thing to compare. Let me see. <clears throat> it's the easiest way to show this. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the best way to do this is, but. Let me see. Let me try to get this in focus, man. Wow. So I, I don't know. That's my finger. <laughs> Thank you. It's kind of like uh, table salt, right? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little coarser than table salt. Um, if not, it's like for me, this is on like a medium. I, you know, I guess I'll call it a medium fine. It's not super fine. Um, and it. It'll typically brew around like three, three and a half. And I think that that's kind of, that's kind of where I usually keep it. Yeah, and what grinder are you using? I'm what grinder, I mean? Yeah, the brand. Yeah, I'm using a Brazza Forte with uh, the brew burrs. Yeah. Very, very good. Maybe brand. any idea? Uh, What's the best um, grind for Commandante? For how many clicks for the? Commandante, I don't use often, but I typically brew around like 20 to 23. Okay. And then I'll just kind of work myself down from that. Yeah, because I always have that issue when I start brewing a, a new coffee, like from a new roastery. I never can find the right uh, grind size. And I brew almost 200 grams of the coffee and it tastes like shit. Oh man, <laughs> that's crazy, man. And, and does it ever taste like, oh, this is great and the whole bag is great or sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't? You know, it's always, always like, I take it's like 250 grams in a bag. First 200 yeah. grams is me finding out the right uh, grinding. And last 50 is the perfect coffee. <laughs> so I have like, two or three perfect coffees per bag. <laughs> that, that basically makes you like someone that has a very specific taste. Like you have, you're kind of a super taster then. <laughs> I, don't know, I like, I like my, my coffee. It's like, I need, it needs to be the best every time. You know, that, that's actually like great though, because I feel like I'm the opposite. Like I'm, I'm only looking for brew defects. Like I'm always just looking for like, what's wrong with this brew? Like what, you know, that that's, yeah like that's most of what I focus on but I have friends that are that are kind of similar to you where it's like really high standard like man it it it, it sucks and then I'll taste it I'm like this is pretty good man <laughs> it's terrible so, especially when you go to a cafe that's not uh, exactly specialty cafe and you just want to drink a coffee and you can cannot because the flavor isn't it I yeah. hate that oh yeah I hate that too so everyone is ready to brew or yeah, I think so. Uh, give me like two minutes. Let's get started. All right. <laughs> One last cup of coffee for today. I know, right? So how many grams do you guys brew? Uh, right now I'm going with 14. Oh, nice. What about you, Ray? I, I'm, I usually just do 18. 18. And for how many, how many grams of water? Uh, for, uh, it's about 345. So okay. I do like a 1 to 19 most of the time. Yeah, I got you. Just one second, gonna grab my water. Yeah, on my way. Yeah, I got everything ready and forgot the dripper. Just one second. How many seconds blown normally, Ray? It's about like 
35 to 45, but I, I usually just wait until the sound transitions from like a, 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 a stream to like kind of drips. And then like once the stream kind of ends, then I know like most of the most of the water in the bloom is kind of drained. And that's when I'll just kind of start uh, pulsing. And that's kind of just uh, a way of getting the same amount of water level for every pulse more than anything. Just so like my starting, you know, my starting water level is a certain point, And then every time it goes down, every time I bring it back up, it'll always reach the same. Height. So that's kind of uh, something that I've always kind of brewed with. And like recently, like with the mellow drip, I've been like my, my sec, my first mellow drip pulse would be about like two inches higher close to the, uh, the, the kind of outer edge of the, the dripper, just so I could wash off the, the grounds on the side. So that's kind of helped incorporate everything into, um, into the slurry before I actually just start kind of doing my regular pulses. And at least for Mellow Drip, I always, uh, recommend doing multi pulses, like at least like four pulses, um, just to keep the water level above the slurry, uh, kind of as low as possible. So is for reducing the heat loss? It's basically to reduce the amount of um, surface runoff. So the amount of water that can effectively drain out before it passes through a majority of the particles. So Basically, I guess people call it bypass, um, just to reduce that more than anything. And I think that's more important towards the end of the brew, where there's a lot more resistance on the filter paper, and there's a lot, there's more likelihood that the water is going to drain out uh, above the surface of the slurry towards the end. I think you're right about using metal drip for compensation. Thinking about you <laughs> making four pours at the same time and I have to talk <laughs> and you have to use it. It's crazy, right? And it's like, yeah. it's, it, you know, it's, it's difficult because um, people always tell me is like, I can't, I want to take a picture of, <laughs> I want to take a picture of myself using this thing, but I don't have a third hand. And you know, <laughs> that's, that's the problem is that like, when you have a product, it's like, you want to be able to have customers show it off and like, Melodrip has this handicap where it's like, unless you have a tripod, you're not going to be able to take a picture of yourself using it. Um, but it, it also, you know, because of the nature of the whole, like how you use it, uh, I think people already know what they're getting into. It's like, do you want another tool in your hand when you're brewing? If the answer is no, it's like, this tool is not meant for you. It's just as simple as that. And so a lot of people who do use it don't really complain because they, they, they know what they're getting themselves into. And I think most of the people who buy Mellow Drip are kind of, you know, they, they want something different. They want a different kind of experience. So they seem to add something else to their arsenal or to their brewing method. And uh, I think because of just the way it is, it's like it's pretty descriptive. You know that you're going to have to handle this thing, another thing, you know, along with your kettle. Uh, but I, I obviously, I've, find it a little interesting and, and fun to use because I get to uh, kind of pour and control in a different way. So yeah, typically people don't have a problem with using it unless unless it's like in competition that they have to use more than one. It's at a cafe where they have to brew multiple cups at once. So what are you guys brewing right now? What coffees? Damn, I don't remember. I had to check the back. <laughs> I know, right? Do you have like a lot of stuff lying around all the time? Yeah, not much, but uh, I think I have three open bags of coffee over there. So I just pick one. <laughs> That's a lot of coffee. Uh, for me, it's uh, Columbia from Polish uh, roastery. So it, are there a lot of roasteries popping up around your area? I mean, 
in city that I that I live in now, there's three actually, and that's like a lot for a Polish city. Ray, what do you think will be the best coffee um, when you use Malatrae? Because I I know that when I use Malatrae, every time it's giving me a a more clean taste. So what do you think the best coffee for Malatrae or Malatrae favorite? The best yeah, I, it's. I think rather than like a best coffee is more like uh, the kind of roast. Like, um, I think it tastes best when the extractions are higher when you're when you're yielding higher extractions. So, um, I think like a typical like, at least in U.S. SC tradition, it's like eighteen to twenty one percent extraction. So if you're brewing like fifteen grams of coffee, um, and your TDS is like one point three five. And you're outputting like eight ounce or whatever it is. The standard American cup of coffee is probably not strong enough in terms of uh, the development of flavors. So, like, I usually encourage people to extract like above 21 if they can, or on the higher end of that spectrum. Um, and and if a roaster is basically profiling for yield. Or strong extraction, then that coffee, you know, will kind of be optimal. Some coffees are roasted and designed to be brewed really quick, and they have higher solubility, and taste great at like 18% or like just kind of at a standard traditional extraction, um, and it's strong. Um, but you know, once you go higher, it starts to taste a little too sharp or a little too strong. And those coffees, I think, can be brewed in any way, and and tastes great. It's just that for Melodrip, I think for my current like recommended recipe, it's for like a higher extraction and you get the clarity, you get a lot of the development of sweetness and acidity um, when you, you know, extract it properly. And that's kind of what it is. So that goes for, you know, like delicate Ethiopia's, uh, you know, down to just more of the meaty you know, centrals. Um, it really depends on the coffee and the roast. It's something that could be pushed kind of to a higher extraction. Uh, that's kind of where it shines. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have a simple answer for it. It's not a simple tool. That's that's the hardest part about selling this thing is like- it's That's a very, difficult question. <laughs> it's very difficult to communicate it to people who aren't like, you know, super into coffee brewing because it's just for people who are into coffee brewing. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I don't expect people to pick this up. Like, I actually turn people away from picking it up when they say, I'm just getting into brewing and I saw your tool, it looks awesome. Like, uh, you know, what, what does it do? Can I, have, you know, and I'm like, nah, man, it's just, you know, make, make a bunch of coffee, fail a bunch of times. And when you feel like you need something else, then, you know, then think about it, you know? It's just, it's more, it is complicated in, in one sense, but, if you are an intermediate brewer and you have your recipes down, it can offer consistency and you can be brain dead in, in the middle of the, you know, six in the morning and just make a consistent pour over because you don't have to worry about pour angle. You don't have to worry about uh, the amount of agitation or flow rate coming out of, you know, 75% of your brew because it's just passing through the same thing. Um, so it, it, it depends on where you are in the game, like if it's going to add value to you or not. That's, that's, that's the thing. So I'm, I'm a terrible salesman when it comes to mail drip because I don't turn people away. It's like, no, no, because you're going to come back to me after like three months and say, how do I use this thing? You know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, nah, nah, you know, and, and obviously, you know, I walk them through it and, and teach them how to use it and, and you know, they begin to enjoy it. But I think most of the people who buy it, like want it, like they, they're going in because they want more than just their kettle can offer. They want more than um, the kind of extraction that they're getting uh, with their current setup. They want to taste something different. Or they want to apply different kinds of variables to what they're doing. And that's that's kind of what I'm about. Like I'm always searching for a different way to do something. So those are the people who I want to communicate with and, and kind of share ideas with. Um, so it's, it's kind of it's 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 a strange tool. So it's 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 difficult to answer any question about like why someone should get it or what it does. I can answer what it does, it's just gonna take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Uh, Tanya say you're a very humble person. I, I think you're a great person. Um, how, how's your coffee? It's good. Yeah, it's good. 
<laughs> this is brewed. This is uh, roasted in Brooklyn by Say Coffee Roasters. Um, they're great, kind of more on the lighter side of, uh, uh, I guess, the spectrum. Um, super consistent, and they don't carry tons of the same lot. So, like every week, they'll have like new coffees come in um, from interesting, uh, interesting farmers interesting processes um, and always super consistent. And you could push these coffees super hard without getting like weird defects. Uh, so they're great to experiment with, um, super clean, great people. But at the end of the day, it's just, you know, like I, I think the philosophy, you know, matches. So I think they want to cater to people who want to do just stretch coffee in different ways. And they offer a rose profile that does that. And, you know, I also love Onyx which is like a solid, you know, more on the traditional American roaster. Um, but they have great green and amazing aromatics um, and they're super easy to brew. So it's just, you know, I'm always trying to taste the spectrum and stuff. Thank you. But yeah. Um, has anyone here participated in giveaway this week? <laughs> because you have, you have a chance to win a metal trip. Thank you, Ray, for sharing oh. your metal trip all the time with us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Is is Ashley on the call? <laughs> yeah, and Ray, I wanted to ask you about this because uh, I couldn't see metal drip available in Europe. Man, like I wish I wish I could see it in Europe too, man. <laughs> it's complicated, isn't it? Like uh, to import products <laughs> into crazy. Europe and sell it. Yeah. Um, it's so crazy, man. Shipping is so expensive. Like I'm getting a lot of orders from the UK in the past few months. And I don't know why, but because it's expensive, it costs, you know, it costs about like not half, but almost like half what the melody costs. So it's, it's difficult to get it out there. I try to contact Coffee Desk PL out in Poland yeah. um, because we service the EU really well. Um, and, you know, I still don't have a contact there, but I think uh, at the with end, uh, coffee desk. Yeah, I coffee mean, desk. Uh, I can help you with that. I mean, if uh, you can, it would be fantastic, man. Um, I've sent. I mean, my family member is a main B two B over there, so I I will surely talk with him about metal drip after great. this conversation because was, I was extremely curious about how it works and you know the whole idea behind it. And after this whole presentation and conversation, I am so fucking amazed. Like, <laughs> I want it. I want it so bad. There's like a few people in Poland who have it. And um, I've, I've always tried to get it out there because specialty is so huge out there. And it's been huge, right? Um, I mean, it's huge in Poland. I mean, uh, in Poland, especially coffee has like its own bubble. When it's huge in its own bubble. <laughs> It's only like six percent of the coffee that's being imported into Poland is specialty coffee, so it's really not that much. I, I guess I guess the way the media portrays it, it's like, oh man, this place is bubbling up. <laughs> but it, yeah, because it, we have really great, um, really great uh, advertisement campaigns uh, from our uh, Polish roasteries and stuff. Yeah, like the I used to DM with the guy from uh, Hard Beans, and he Hard Beans, yeah. Uh, crazy stuff in in his lab um, yeah they were uh, the last project is extremely cool like they did a uh, nitro coffee and collaborated with polish brewery and now it's a beer that's based on nitro coffee nice. a stout like yeah by yeah. doing that i think they they pop up on the world worldwide world, worldwide like scene yeah Oh, Great, definitely. thank you. Um, let's see who's here. Praise. Are you, are you there? Hi. Hey, uh, if you don't know, Praise is from Brazil and she's doing a lot of a great work to support local community. Um, let's share some your story about Brazilian coffee and farmers okay. and what you're doing and what you're drinking right now. Can I start this? Uh, just asking Ray about uh, Melo Drip in Brazil, because it's re re very difficult to find this here too. I mean, I don't know anybody here to have this. <laughs> um, 
shipping. It's like, that's my only excuse. I'm, I'm a small, like a nano company, but it, it definitely is the shipping. Um, I think the one of the, there's a couple competitors out there that have it. Rafa Mendez has it. Uh, there's another competitor that has it, but these guys, they got it maybe like a couple years ago. Um, and it, I would say Brazil, especially like 50% of my packages get lost. And so <clears throat> it's difficult to, uh, I, I think it's difficult to like tell people, you know, when, when they want to get it and they do order it. Um, I always follow up with an email like, hey, man, you know, I'm getting this insured, you know, just mainly because it's, it's, there's a likelihood that it's going to get lost. I need to find distributors, but it is, you know, and, uh, but otherwise, I, I do have fans in Brazil and there's people who always ask me about getting in Brazil and like, especially the, you know, uh, the, the baristas and, and the competitors, but uh, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I need to get my distribution game up is what I need yeah. to tell you. <laughs> hey, if everybody here today has some network and you want really, really want to introduce Little Drip to your friends, your neighborhood, a coffee shop, local, just uh, contact Ray and then see, maybe we can have some collaboration helping to export this great product because this one is just really great. I think I'm the only one in Russia has it right now. <laughs> so That's anyway. You. Yeah, you are one of the, you are one of the few. I do get a lot of off, uh, orders from Russia though, man. I don't know what, uh, maybe you are passing along. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be sharing your product with the local roaster and cafes, you know, sending out emails and asking if they're interested in it. Because like you said, like uh, a lot of parts of it got lost and the transportation, like, uh, yeah, the cost is pretty high to ship it, but it's really a great product. Thank you. Um, Prey? Hey. Um, <laughs> Well, we know that you recently uh, got a new job. Um, could you tell me, uh, tell us about your new role there? <laughs> For sure. Um, first, uh, the coffee I'm drinking is from the, the association that I'm working with. And this coffee is the third place of the, the very first quality competitors we had there um, some weeks ago. And it's like a very new for us. We never had this in our region. Uh, we had uh, some very experience there because we, we found amazing coffees and we are very proud of our producers. We are working with uh, small and medium producers in, in Minas Gerais. The, we are the, the fourth place, biggest place to produce coffee in the world. And it's like a very challenging thing to us because when you talk, when you start talking about quality in coffee in the region, just to see a very amount of coffee to produce, they had a, a, a little resistance to understand what we're talking about. And we are, t we, they actually, this association there uh, just has like, they are working with this, those producers since. Um, 2016 and I started talk I started talking with them two years ago and now I am part of the, the job and we are trying to improve our quality and to share this with the international market in a fair fair trade. So it's um, a very interesting uh, job to to make part because we are we are trying to to make the the producers life better trying to understand what they have uh, like a priority to to live better and to to try to understand their own their own coffee because a lot of people there never drink before their own coffee so it's like you produce the best shoes but you, you don't have the, the ability to, to wear this and to say if it's comfortable or not. So it's crazy because it's their, their work for all the, the year and the coffee they, produ they produce is just a, a sell like a, a commodity coffee, but we have some gold there and we need to find the, those gold and we need to, to understand how to start to, to make this job uh, making more, more, more famous. They deserve this. 
their life is very important for us who drink coffee a lot. And the world needs to understand how they are uh, making an, an excellent wor work and how they want to, to improve their work. So we need to, to follow them close and to, to stay here uh, to support them. And be, being part of the, the Give It Away with you is very important for us because it's like a, a chance to then understand how it's important uh, and to be together. And well, I'm glad to be here today talking about those works. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think the reason, um, the main reason why uh, I'm not various that here exists is because we want to build this connection between people from different countries, from farming countries to consuming countries. And in this case, we can all on the same picture understand the industry problem that we're facing together, because if the farmers don't have coffee, cannot grow coffee anymore, we won't have coffee in our cups. It doesn't matter what tools we have here, it's gonna be a problem for everyone. So when we drink great coffee from Africa, from Brazil, from Mexico, we should show our appreciation to the farmers who are working really, really hard there. And uh, today we also have Tanti um, from Indonesia, and she has been doing great, wonderful job for the local community. And during the pandemic, she and her friend uh, organized a online LATR competition for the barista who can, who can do anything at this moment, but everybody's having fun there. And according to her this time, her online competition has 150 people. That's crazy. So um, let's get to meet Tenti. Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it started uh, because of the pandemic. And then like uh, many of the barista like having to be at home and they like doesn't have this life spirit. And we, because we are a, a home barista, a home brewer, home barista, so we usually just go from coffee shop to coffee shop. So we know these baristas, and then to see that it's a little sad. And then my friend who actually like only us, let's throw a virtual uh, latte art. So it's like no um, plan at the beginning. So it's just like yeah, let's go, and then it's um, it looks very well. So it uh, like surprising us. And then uh, we started uh, uh, more uh, focus on it. So we also have like a online class, but it's for short topic. So it's free. And then we pick uh, like 20, 30 because most of them won't have uh, money to pay for the course. It's uh, too expensive for them. And we made it a very short topic, uh, each specific, and then like like roasting, we can make like uh, four, five, uh, each time different uh, uh, topics, so we won't get clash with the uh, formal courses in here too. And also, we uh, sometimes we give a scholarship on the payment course, but probably like uh, only for like two, three people, something like that. But that's what we do. And then from the uh, latte art, we just wrote on the second one. It's actually on the final, we do the Zoom, so it's live and they have to talk and they, they make end the presentation. Because like in here in the national competition, we always see the same face. It needs money to like to join, like to practice and uh, everything and mostly from the big coffee shop. But this person and Indonesia is very big, it's from uh, 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 Sumatra and uh, until the Papua and then it's like many don't have chance for that and it's good for them to have like a platform to try and uh, who knows like hopefully one day they have chance to go to the uh, national competition or something bigger that's all thank, thank you, you for sharing thank you Mickey. you're doing a wonderful job um, well if you're in, from Indonesia, you can join a competition and uh, learn about latte. And then I just shared the link of the, on Instagram. And also Ray has recently started on YouTube, become YouTube blogger, right? 
Not really. You have, you have two <laughs> videos there. That's amazing, really. And I also share a link below so you guys can go and click and to follow him on YouTube. His video is awesome. And I really like his knowledge. Um, that's it for, yeah, that's our main guest. I think we have one special guest from US, Ola Express Cafe. Andres, are you there? Oh, maybe it's busy at working in a food truck. <laughs> All right, guys, now we can have a Q&A section. You can ask anything to Ray, to Praise, to Tenti, to everyone. And you can turn on your camera, turn on your uh, microphone, so we can get to know each other. And if you have participated giveaway, we're going to draw the winners very soon. Yeah, a question for Ray. Uh, What's the impact of melt drip to dark roast? For example, if you get uh, espresso roast and want to uh, brew in a V60, how does it affect the taste? Have you tried? <laughs> I have tried, and I think I think the clarity that mellow drip offers is a specific kind of clarity. So it obviously doesn't affect anything before the coffee is roasted. <clears throat> What it does is it's more of kind of like a mouthfeel and texture thing. Some people describe it as being silky or just more of a lighter body. Um, so that's that's kind of what it is. It's it's regardless of the roast style, like if it's dark roast, you will taste more of what's there. Um, if it's some type of roastiness or if it's some type of, uh, if there's some kind of sharpness in the roast, <coughs> you will, probably tastes you know more of what you don't like or more of what not, might not taste good from that coffee so that's kind of the trade-off as well um i think a lot of people have told me it's it's you know mellow drip is like it, it's it's not great for every coffee and 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 it, it's it's true it's it's something that's kind of specific for the specialty like crazy home brewer or like the home brewing fanatic market um, more than anything. So, you know, pairing it with more of a traditional solubility or traditional roast style, um, it it does clarify it from my perspective. Of course, like I can taste the clarity that delivers, but I think to the person who's expecting something from that kind of traditional roast might want more, they want my, might want more uh, creaminess or more body, uh, more chocolate, uh, something that'll kind of support that kind of darker end of the spectrum. So um, I, I, you know, I, I would have to brew it for someone who likes darker roasted coffee to actually ask them, you know, what, what, what is, you know, what the outcome is, if it's better or worse, I, I you know, I don't know. For me, it tastes like a melody of coffee with a different roast. <laughs> so I'm the wrong person to ask, but it does deliver the same kind of clarity. The only thing is that uh, darker roasted coffees are typically more like soluble. They're easier to brew. So you can get a decent extraction with a coarse grind. Um, and coarse grinds typically have less insolubles and less fines. So you can get a clean cup of coffee uh, just by changing the, the, the grind size to something that's coarser. Um, so it's, it's kind of counterintuitive because like Melody have designed for like finer grinds. Um, and harder to extract coffees and that you know you could use a stick and you can use ag agitation all the stuff um, that could take some abuse um so you can extract like more from them but from coffees that are really easy to brew uh it kind of takes too much <laughs> it might taste a little too sharp a little too strong you know where you don't want it um so i i you know i i think it depends on like the recipe and how you use it, you could probably get something that you like out of it. Uh, I just don't brew enough darker roasted coffees to really give a straight answer if it's better or worse. Sorry. <laughs> no, I gotta, I gotta try much. some tomorrow and I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. Gotta try some dark roast Brazilian coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, Igor, you have more questions there. Uh, no, no, I just say thank you. Yeah, <laughs> answer is great. <laughs> Thank you. Great. 
Oh, let's see. We have a special guest over here. Andre? Okay. Hello. Hi guys. How are you? I'm I'm here at the coffee truck and I have some customers going on and back and forth. So I'm sorry if I didn't, you know, completely attend the the talk, but it's great to see you all and thank you so much for this effort. Let me show you a little bit. <laughs> The little Linea Mini right here. Nice. Beautiful machine. Where are you? San Antonio, Texas. Fantastic. Yep. Wow. <laughs> Pretty hot out there right now. <laughs> let me let me show you real quick from, from the outside. Just bragging about my, my coffee trucks. Nice. <laughs> Blue. <laughs> yeah. So I'm here and I didn't have my employee coming uh, out today. So I needed to stay here and work. Thank you so much. And thank you thank for you donating your coffee and your sharing your coffee mugs and everything. Sure, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Stay tuned. And uh, we're we will keep doing this kind of community event together and sharing Boyan recipes, invite special guests like Ray, sharing the best brewing knowledge and get to know each other. And no matter where you're from, um, yep, this is the time we get to know each other. Drink some coffee. If you're participating and you win coffee, you can share with your friends or you can donate to someone else in need. And because in the end, coffee connects. Okay. All right, it's been uh, one and a half hour already. So thank you, everyone. We will stop here today and I will see everyone. See you everyone next week. Perfect. Thank, thank you, you, Ray. Thank you, Praise. Thank you, Tenti. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See Have you next week. time. See you. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Ray. You're awesome. You too. Thanks for everything you guys do, man. See you soon, man. <laughs>